Hey guys, welcome back to another video. In this one, I'll attempt to cover Turkey in a nutshell. Let's see how that's gonna play out. Turkey is a very unique and a diverse country, located literally in the middle of the world. Well, that depends where you consider the center of the world is, but for us, if there is such a thing, that should be Turkey. That being said, let's start with the geopolitics. Turkey is located between Europe and Asia. It's made up of two parts, Anatolia, historically referred as the Asia Minor, and Thrace. Its capital city is Ankara since 1923, but the country's economically, socially, and culturally biggest city is Istanbul. Turkey has well-defined natural borders with its eight neighbors and surrounded by waters on three sides. To the south, it's bordered by Syria and Iraq. To the east, Iran, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. By the Black Sea, Turkey's neighbors with Russia, Ukraine, Romania and to the west, Bulgaria and Greece. And then there is Cyprus. It's a little complicated situation, but long story short, it was mainly inhabited by Greeks in 1570 when the Ottoman Empire conquered the island and Turks have started settling there. It came under the British rule in 1878 and in 1960 Cyprus gained independence from Britain following a decade of ethnic tensions and coup d'etats. In 1974, Turkey launched an offensive to capture the northern part of the island. The UN got involved and brokered a peace deal. The Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus was established and to this day it is only recognized by Turkey and the island remains divided. However, Republic of Northern Cyprus is not a part of Turkey. And then there's this situation in the west with Greece. Most of the islands in the Aegean Sea belong to Greece. I mean, even Samos Island, which is stone throws away from the mainland Turkey and miles and miles away from mainland Greece. This entire situation generally causes disputes between the two countries as to who owns how much of the Aegean Sea. This problem further expands into the eastern Mediterranean, where Turkey has ongoing oil and gas exploration campaigns. Speaking of oil and gas exploration campaigns, the region where no issues have been encountered with regards to this is the Black Sea. Here, the borders have been well defined, so there are no conflicts arising between Turkey and its neighboring countries in the region. And as a result of uninterrupted search campaigns, in 2020, Turkey has finally struck a large gas field in the Black Sea. This natural gas field is said to have 405 billion cubic meters of natural gas which the country is expected to make use of by 2023. Let's take a look at our neighbors to the east. Georgia and Iran have no border issues with Turkey and the borders are always open. However, Turkey's border with Armenia is closed. Why? Well, the two states don't get along very well and I mean, this topic requires a whole nother episode on its own, so we're just gonna pass. And then there's this little guy called Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic. It's a part of Turkey's little brother, Azerbaijan, but it has no direct connection with the mainland, it's only border with Turkey, Armenia and Iran. The geopolitics of Turkey is not easy to understand. To the south, Turkey is bordered by Syria and Iraq. Turkey has cross-border military operations in these countries, but not against those countries, but rather against the organization called the PKK, which is designated as a terrorist organization by Turkey, the United States, the EU, Japan, Australia and other countries. Turkey has a large influence in the region, however. Turkey and Qatar are on good terms. Saudi Arabia, UAE and Egypt have a love and hate relationship with Turkey. Bosnia, Albania and Kosovo can be added to the list of friendly countries except for Serbia. Russia and Turkey have a deep history of wars and alliances and today these two countries are fine with each other. Although from time to time they find themselves on the opposite side of the table when talking about regional conflicts. Well, that really summarizes Turkey and Russia's relationship. These are two countries with generally conflicting interests, but somehow they come together to find a mutual ground. Well, there are always two sides to a story, much like Istanbul. Uh, it's a city that has two sides, and that's what I call a transition. In fact, Istanbul is the only transcontinental city in the world. That, in my opinion, accurately represents Turkey's position. Turkey has always been the crossroads of the world. On one side, you have Europe and the EU. On the other side, you have the Middle East and Asia. Although the country tries to have a balanced relationship with both sides, sometimes it can find itself in the middle of conflicts. But 
this didn't stop Turkey from allying its neighboring powers. Turkey has been a member country of NATO since 1952, and the country is negotiating its accession to the European Union as a member state following its application to accede to the European Economic Community, the predecessor of the EU, in 1987. After 10 founding members, Turkey was one of the first countries to become a member of the Council of Europe in 1949. However, Turkey is still not a member of the EU, and the Turkish citizens are asked to obtain a visa to enter the Schengen area. That kind of puts the Turkish passport in a weaker position compared to European countries, but it's still a strong passport within the region. With the green one that is issued to civil servants, you can access the Schengen area visa-free. Well, I mean, the ordinary Turkish passport allows visa free travel to 110 countries, which is not bad. Some of those visa free countries are located in the Central Asia. They are members of the alliance of Turkic speaking countries. These are generally known as Istan countries, such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. In addition to them, Azerbaijan is a sovereign state. Turkey also has an influence and a good relationship with the Turkic speaking republics and territories in Russia. Russia and China, most notably with Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Altai Republic, Yakutsk in Russia, and East Turkestan in China, where Uyghur people live. Okay, you seem a little confused about how a Middle Eastern slash European country has a lot in common with people over there in Siberia and China. And to understand that, we have to take you back in time. Way back in time. Historians generally agree that the first Turkic people lived in a region extending from the Central Asia to Siberia. Historically, they were established after the 6th century BCE. The Han hordes of Attila, who invaded and conquered much of Europe in the 5th century. It's argued by some scholars that they were one of the earlier Turkic tribes, while others argue that they were of Mongolic origin. Well, Turks and Mongolians have a lot in common anyway. They looked alike, they talked alike, and they fought alike. So much so that at one point, a great portion of Genghis Khan's army was made up of Turkic warriors. But that was in 12th century or 11th AD. Uh, prior to that, Turkic people had numerous empires. In the 6th century, the Gökturks ruled the region. From 552 to 745, Gökturk leadership united the nomadic Turkic tribes into the Gökturk Empire. The empire retained elements of its original shamanistic religion, Tengrism, although it received missionaries of Buddhist monks and practiced a syncretic religion. The Gökturks were the first Turkic people to write Old Turkic in a runic script, the Orhon script. The Khanate was also the first state known as Turk. Towards the end of the century, the Gökturk's Khanate was split into two, Eastern Turkic Khanate and Western Turkic Khanate. After the collapse of the Khanate, Turkic people and related groups migrated west from Turkestan and what is now Mongolia towards Eastern Europe, Iranian Plateau, and Anatolia, and modern-day Turkey in many waves. One of the most notable empires Turks established was the Seljuk Empires, the borders of which stretch from the modern-day Tajikistan to Turkey. It's noteworthy leader Alpaslan's victory over the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 ushered in the Turkoman settlement of Anatolia. After the collapse of the Seljuk Empire, many smaller states in the name of Beyliks appeared in Anatolia. One of them evolved into the Great Ottoman Empire, which ruled most of Balkans, Anatolia, Arabia, Caucasus, and North Africa for six centuries. Following the World War I, the empire collapsed and the modern Turkish Republic was established. Due to this diverse ethnological composition, Turks are distinct from the people living in the neighboring countries. And since we're talking about the people, let's take a look at the modern Turks. Out of 83 million inhabitants of the country, about 70% of the population identify as ethnically Turkish. Between 15 to 20% identify as Kurdish and about 3% identify as Arabs. The rest is made up of Zaza, Circassians, Persians, Romani, Albanians, Armenians, Greeks and others. Although the people of Turkey are predominantly Muslim, Turkey is officially a secular country with no official religion. As far as the language is concerned, Turkish is the only language and pretty much is spoken by everyone. Other spoken languages are Kurdish, Arabic, Persian, Aramaic, Zazaki, Laz, Armenian, and Greek, and more. 
Our currency is Turkish Lira, our dialing code is plus 90 and we drive on the right side of the road. This sounded a little like uh, geography now and that's where the idea came from. I mean, thank you guys, I learned much from you and since you guys were not, you know, able to come until the Turkey episode, so I basically decided, why don't I do something before they get there? I hope I didn't ruin your schedule. If I did, I'm sorry, but I'm just gonna link your channel down there so people can go there and see where this video is really originated and when you're doing your Turkey episode just please uh, give me a call all right anyway this was the history of the turkish people but there's also the history of the land Anatolia is the cradle of civilizations. It truly is. I mean, near Şanlıurfa, there's a Neolithic archaeological site called Göbekli Tepe. I mean, this is this is crazy. The site, believed to have been a sanctuary of ritual significance, is marked by layers of carved megaliths and is estimated to date to nine to ten millennium BCE. I have no idea what religious beliefs they had, but based on the pillars and the depictions on them, it looks like a pagan-ish religion. Religion. I mean, it's a very interesting subject and there's an insightful documentary about it by BBC. If you're interested, I'll leave the link somewhere around here. Um, you can click on it and you can actually watch it. It's actually um, very good. One of my favorite documentaries of all time. But let's take a look at the timeline. In 6500 BC, a Neolithic city is established at Çatalhöyük in Central Asia, the world's first known settlement. 5000 BC, Stone and Copper Age, people have already been living in Anatolia for 20,000 years now. 1900 BC to 1300 BC, the Hittite Empire flourishes, battles Egypt, Patriarch Abraham, who has been dwelling in Haran near Şanlıurfa. 1300 to 1260 BC, the Trojan Wars described by Homer in the Iliad. 900 BC to 353 BC, rise of the Phrygian, Lydian and Carian culture and the Persians invaded the land. In 334, Alexander the Great of Macedon sweeps across Asia Minor. In 129 BC, Anatolia becomes the Roman province of Asia with its capital at Ephesus. 56 AD, St. Paul stays in the city of Ephesus and writes his famous epistle, which are the 21 of 27 books of the New Testament. 330 AD, Roman Emperor Constantine chooses the minor town of Byzantium as the capital of the Roman Empire, rebuilding it in the image of Rome and renaming it Constantinople. 537 AD, inauguration of Hagia Sophia Church in Istanbul by the Emperor Justinian, until the arrival of Turks and the Byzantines Empire ruled the land. Between 1037 to 1109, the land was invaded by the Turkish Empire of the Great Seljuks. Between 1071 to 1243, the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum, an offshoot of the Great Seljuk Empire, established in Anatolia with its capital in Konya. The poet and philosopher Jalaleddin Rumi, called Mevlana, takes up residence in Konya. 1299, the Ottoman state is formed by Osman Bey, from whom it takes its Turkish name, Osmanlı. 1453, Sultan Mehmed II conquered Istanbul, bringing the Byzantine Age to an end. 1520 to 1566, reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Great Age of the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan ruled most of North Africa, most of Eastern Europe and all of the Middle East. 1914, Ottoman Empire enters the First World War on the side of the Germans. 1923, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk establishes the Republic of Turkey. And that's the current state of the land we live in today. There's no doubt that it's an abundant land in terms of natural resources, fertile lands, a young population, and a manufacturing economy. And that's what we're going to talk about next. The economy of Turkey is an emerging market economy as defined by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Turkey is among the world's developed countries according to the CIA World Factbook. The country is also defined by economists and political scientists as one of the world's newly industrialized economies. Turkey has the world's 13th largest GDP by PPP, that is $2.3 trillion, with a per capita income of $28,000. And by 2023, Turkey wants to be within the top 10 economies in the world. Now, to make that happen, Turkey has been 
investing into its infrastructure for years. Is our mega projects such as new major highway systems, cross continental tunnels, massive suspension bridges, international hub airports, large scale hydroelectric dam projects, nuclear power plants, and Istanbul International Finance Center. The country is among the world's leading producers of textiles, motor vehicles, transportation equipment, construction materials, consumer electronics, and home appliances. Industrial activities account for a significant portion of the country's economy, yet the juiciest part still though comes from tourism, which is approximately between 11 to 12 percent of the GDP. Turkey ranks sixth in the world in terms of the number of international tourists arrival, with 51.2 million foreign tourists visiting the country every year. Tourism is one of the most dynamic and fastest growing sectors in Turkey. According to travel agencies, 11 out of 100 best hotels in the world are located in Turkey. Over the years, Turkey has emerged as a popular tourist destination for many Europeans competing with Greece, Italy and Spain. I mean, how could it not be, right? I mean, just look at Istanbul the capital of three empires, the footprint of all still remains. Blue Lagoon will strike you as Maldives, Mount Ararat, the highest point of Turkey, and as described in Bible, is the resting place of Noah's Ark. Cappadocia, with its unique geological, historical and cultural futures and also the balloons. Mardin is famous for its articulate architecture of its old city. Black Sea region, which is prettier than Switzerland. I mean, well, maybe that's a little too much, but I mean, in my opinion, it's as pretty as Switzerland, right? And Pamukkale is where the world's most famous minerals and hot springs are located. I mean, tourists from all over the world flock annually for a spa-like experience, seeking therapeutic and medicinal benefits and some good old-fashioned relaxation. I mean, folks, you name it, we have it. The tourism in Turkey is so unique and so diverse that in Antalya, in the same day, you can ski on the snowy mountains and swim at Konyaaltı Beach, which is known as the Miami Beach of Turkey, on the same day. Now, tell me if this is not unique. In fact, everything about Turkey is unique as its name. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little funny, but when I first started learning English, I always asked myself why my country's name meant a bird that we eat. I mean, that didn't make a lot of sense to me until I learned the story behind its name. It's a little complicated story, but bear with me. The word Turkey means the land of Turks, which makes all the sense, right? The bird Turkey story, however, is rather misunderstood and here is why. First of all, let's refer to this Turkey bird with its scientific name, Maliagris Galapagos. The bird is endemic to the American continent. It has literally nothing to do with Turkey at all. All right, we got that, that's good. We call Maliagris Galapagos Hindi in Turkish, and that means India. Now, we Turks call the bird Turkey India because the bird came to Turkey, well, back then the Ottoman Empire, from India. But the bird that came from India was not Maliagris Galapagos, it was a guinefowl, another type of bird which looks like Maliagris Galapagos. It came to India, though, from Africa. Confused yet? Well, there's more to the story. The guinefowl that went to India, from there came to Turkey, went to Europe, and Europeans called it Turkey or the Turkey bird, while we called it Hindi or the Hindi bird. Now, here's where it gets interesting. When Europeans discovered America, they have misidentified Maliagris Galapagos as Turkey because simply it looked like guinefowl that they used to call Turkey. So the Turkey bird we eat today has nothing to do with the country Turkey. Its scientific name is Maliagris Galapawa, and it is endemic to the American continent, which was misidentified by European settlers, thinking that it was a guinefold, which Turks refer to as Hindi, which meant India. So guys, it's a messed up story, I understand, but we love eating turkey. I mean, in Turkey, we basically eat you know, eating anyway. We have a huge appetite and that's the reason why we have one of the richest cuisines in the world. All right, let's start with the usual suspects, right? Kebabs, baklava, pide, known as the Turkish pizza. We have our own coffee. Simit, the national bagel, covered in sesame seeds. 
and Turkish delight. I mean, do we have a national food? Mm, no, because all of them taste amazing. I mean, just to have a knockoff Turkish food experience dropped by your local Turkish restaurant, which is pretty much in every country right now. The reason why the Turkish cuisine is so rich has a lot to do with our history, yeah? But also because of the ingredients that are grown in these fertile lands that are experiencing four seasons. I mean, there is no denying that the weather here is fantastic. We basically have three different climates. The western and southern coast of the country possesses the Mediterranean climate with hot and dry summers and moderately warm and rainy winters, where summers last nine months. In the northern coast, you have the oceanic climate, which has high and evenly distributed rainfall year round. And the rest of the country has a transitional and continental climate in which the winters are harsh and summers are hot and dry. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching the video. I have tried to squeeze this Wikipedia information into one short video. I don't know how short the video is, by the way. Hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and see you in the next video.